This is John Daly on a little sagebrush-covered mesa overlooking the Mission Alamo. The besieged and completely surrounded garrison of free Texans, less than 200 men, are still blocking the advance of Santa Ana's 3,000 Mexican troops into the heart of free Texas. They still hold out, but it may be that on this morning of March 6th, 1836, Santa Ana's troops will storm forward in their final all-out attack. For a short while ago, Santa Ana's cannon, which for 11 days have kept up a relentless bombardment of the Alamo, suddenly ceased firing. And there are signs of activity in the Mexican lines. Couriers began to dash to and from Santa Ana's headquarters. The Alamo, March 6th, 1836. CBS is there. The defense of the Alamo. CBS asks you to imagine that our microphone is present at this unforgettable moment of Texas history. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. CBS is there. This broadcast, the sixth in a special summer series produced and directed for Columbia by Robert Lewis Shayon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, the Alamo, March 6th, 1836, and John Daly. Just before us, we wonder, as the whole world wonders, what is going on inside the Alamo. The little mission which looks like a brown roosting hen, its head the bell tower and its body the rectangular stockade that stretches back from the mission proper, is ominously quiet. Our CBS mobile unit is outside the Mexican lines and about a half a mile away from the Alamo. The Mexicans have taken no notice of our unit since they first questioned us when we arrived on the scene. The fact that the United States is officially neutral in this revolt of the Texas patriots against the Santa Ana government still protects us and permits us to continue our observation and reports without let or hindrance. No military action in all history can be compared to this siege. These men, these Texans, could have escaped. They had full warning of Santa Ana's approach with his army of 3,000. But they chose to stand because they knew that unless Santa Ana was stopped, if only for a few precious days, unless his relentless march was stalled, all of free Texas would fall before the invaders. Of course, it's still possible that the Alamo may be relieved. It's still possible that reinforcements may come. Involuntarily, we keep staring toward the east, Along the road, relief may come, must come, if it is to come. A road swept by a cold March wind. Actually, we know that the chances for relief are so small as to be practically non-existent. These Texans, these farm boys and trappers and cattle racers, these lads who a few weeks ago were plowing fields and milking cows, have almost overnight become soldiers. And meanwhile, one of the most puzzling aspects of the situation has been the continued silence of the portable radio transmitter we know to be inside the Alamo. Our technicians have been on the alert constantly, day and night. But so far, we have not been able to get any signal from within the walls. Meantime, the panorama of battle stretches out before us. It looks like some toy battlefield. But we know it is real. The bodies of white-clad Mexican soldiers sprawled on the ground are real. The red blood flag denoting no quarter flies from Santa Ana's lines. Soldiers always say that waiting is worse than battle. We know what they mean now. But we will wait here. And this is John Daly returning you to the temporary capital of this infant nation, Washington on the Brazos, and Ken Roberts. This is Ken Roberts inside the small, rude, unpainted building which houses the Free Texas Convention, or consultation as it is called. That cold March wind John Daly spoke about is blowing on the Brazos, too. And the windows of the building have been covered with canvas in an attempt to hold out the cold. The convention, which is working on the Free Texas Constitution, is in recess. Most of the delegates are standing about in small, solemn groups. They're talking quietly and soberly of the news they've just heard from John Daly, the news that the final all-out attack on the Alamo may be impending. Mrs. Eliza Benson, who lives in the neighborhood, is here with me now. She has kindly consented to answer a few questions. Mrs. Benson, I understand you have a son with Lieutenant Colonel Travis at the Alamo. Yes, I have, Mr. Roberts. Well, how long has he been in the Army? Oh, not long. Two weeks, maybe. We only been in Texas all told less than three months. Where did you come from, Mrs. Benson? From Indian Territory, out near Independence Way. See, uh, we had a few acres that Sam, my husband, bought from the land office. Uh Uh-huh. And the Indians come and Sam was killed. We didn't have anything, not even a wagon. So I took my boy, Philip, and we walked down here, 250 miles. Sure was a long walk. Yes, it must have been. And now you have a home here in Texas? Well, we got some acreage near Goliath, but just when Philip was getting set to put in a crop, all this trouble started. All the young men went into the army, and Philip, he went too. Do you think those boys, Philip and the others, will be able to hold off Santa Ana? Well, I didn't know anything about that. Philip is where God put him. 
not for his mother or anyone else to decide such questions. But I know the men who are with him, Billy Travis, Colonel Boyd, David Crockett, and the other lads from our little town, other towns in Texas, they'll be doing what they should be doing. They'll be brave. Thank you, Mr. Benson. I wish you could see these faces around me now. They're American faces, wind-bitten and square-jawed. The language is the language of the Tennessee hills, the Mohawk Valley, the farmlands, the old frontiers, the places you and I know. Although until four days ago, when the Texas Declaration of Independence was signed, this land had been politically foreign, it has long been culturally and physically allied to the United States. These people, these Texans, are the cousins and the brothers and the husbands of our own families. They are our kin. For example, the Texan, the typical Texan, who's standing at our CBS microphone now. He's a tall, bony figure of a man in buckskin breeches and homespun shirt. He's grinning at the description. What is your name, sir? Uh, Smithwick. Noah Smithwick. And where is your home, Mr. Smithwick? Well, I got a parcel out uh, San Felipe way. Well, where was your home before you came to Texas, Mr. Smithwick? Uh, Kentucky. Hopkinsville. And uh, what brought you to Texas? Well, I reckon the same thing that brought the others. A chance to own some land, new start. Maybe just a kind of itch to haul up anchor and see some new ports. <laughs> you talk like a Navy man. Well, uh, I was one during the war against England, 1812. I see. Yeah. Uh, gunners made under good old Constitution. Ironside, that was. Uh-huh. Yeah, I uh, came home after the war and uh, kind of couldn't get used to things, you know. <laughs> and a uh, fellow come through town, he talked mighty big about this here place called Texas and said as how... Uh, Old Moses Austin got himself a whopping big grant of land and was offering uh, farmland and uh, some uh, 400 acres of pasture to folks who would come down this way. So I uh, pack up my kit and caboodle and come down. Well, did you get all that was promised to you, Mr. Smithwick? Uh, uh, I got some. <laughs> well, is Texas what you expected it to be? Well, uh... I reckon it's a mite different from what we was told it would be. Uh, How's that, sir? Well, uh, this fellow who signed us up, he's a tolerable good liar, you know. Liar? Yeah. Uh, he said that there'd be no taxes, and he said as how the country was so full of game. Now, <laughs> get this. Wild horses, turkey, and buffalo, that uh, all one would have to do to get a meal is pitch a bowie knife over his left shoulder. <laughs> and uh, he, he said as how when... You planted corn. You'd have to back up real fast so the stalk wouldn't bash in the chin coming up. <laughs> it's a terrible good lie. <laughs> well, Mr. Smithwick, yeah. how do you feel about what the boys at the Alamo are doing? Holding off Santa Ana, I mean. Giving Texas time. Oh, well, uh, I, I tell you, I figure this way, uh, uh, Mr. Roberts. That's your name, isn't it? That's right, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those, um, those boys, uh, they kind of uh, calculated what the situation was and did what they figured was needed. And uh, it, it's a right uh, grand thing they're doing, and we ain't forgetting that either. Those boys know what they're fighting for. Yes, I guess uh, they do. So we, we, we got no more reason to be part of Mexico than we uh, has to be part of China, you know. Yeah, How's that, Mr. Smithwick? Uh, well, we don't speak the same language, think the same way, and uh, that, that ain't all. We've been doing... A, our best, you know, to mind our own business, asking precious little. But now what's happened? Well, I tell you, Steve Austin goes down to Mexico City to speak our cause, and Santa Ana smacks him into a dungeon for almost a year. Now tell me, is that how free citizens get treated in a decent country? Oh, I guess it isn't. No, you guess right. We ask for schools for our kids and, and little things like trial by a jury and the right to speak a piece when we're in a mind to speak. Now, I know... See, I know what the talk is, is how we're all of us here, nothing but a fool of pirates and ruffians out to stir up trouble. Well, that just ain't so. We're plain, ordinary cops here. Excuse me, Mr. Wickwick. The rider is just out of the convention hall. Oh, his clothes are kicked with mud. He looks tired. He looks as if he's written a long way and written hard. The men are crowding around him now, but he's pushing his way through to the desk. I'm going to try to get up to him. One side, please. Would you step aside, please? Get off that table. Please, let me through. Please. Who is the rider, sir? Where is he from? Billy Travis from the Alamo. He's got a dispatch for General Houston. The rider is from the Alamo. He's come from the Alamo. General Sam Houston has just entered the hall. The rider is talking to him now. And there's Mr. Richard Evans, the president of the convention. The news of the rider's arrival is spread all over. All the delegates are pouring in now. General Houston is reading the dispatch handed to him by the rider. It must be news from the Alamo at last. 
views from inside the animal. Now, now General Houston is talking to Mr. Adams. He's pointing to the dispatch. Wait a minute. Just a moment. Mr. Adams is raising his hand. He's pounding the Quiet, please. Please, quiet. Quiet. Gentlemen, we... We have here a dispatch from Lieutenant Colonel William B. Travis, commanding the garrison at San Antonio, Bexar. Uh, General Houston has asked me to read it to you. To the Commander-in-Chief of the Army of Texas. On the 23rd of February, the enemy in large force entered the city of San Antonio, de Bexar, which could not be prevented as I had not sufficient force to defend my, my position. Uh, Colonel Batras, the adjutant major of the President General Santa Ana, demanded a surrender at discretion, calling us firing rebels. I answered them with a cannon shot. <laughs> the, uh, the enemy... The enemy commenced a bombardment with a five-inch hard, sir, which, together with heavy cannonade, has been kept up incessantly ever since. I instantly sent express to Colonel Fannin at Goliad and to the people of Gonzales and San Felipe. Our numbers are few, and I have every reason to expect an attack from the whole force of the enemy very soon. But I shall hold to the last extremity, hoping to secure reinforcements in a day or two. Do hasten on aid to me as rapidly as possible, as from the superior number of the enemy, it would be impossible for us to keep them out much longer. If they overpower us, we fall a sacrifice at the shrine of our country, and we hope posterity in our country will do our memory justice. Give me help. Oh, my country, victory or death. Signed, W.B. Travis, Lieutenant Colonel. So ends the dispatch. There it is. There you have it. The first official word of the situation within the Alamo. I hope you heard it as Mr. Ellis read it to the delegates here at Washington on the Brazos this morning of March 6, 1836. Although the dispatch confirms everything, John Daly has been able to report to you from the CBS mobile unit. Although most of the information contained in the dispatch is already known, still this is the first official word that has come through from the Alamo itself since it was besieged 11 days ago. While the dispatch was defiant, almost heroic, its meaning is clear. The situation was desperate then when there was still hope for reinforcements. It is even more desperate now that hope is dim. Mr. Ellis, General Houston, and some of the delegates have been holding a consultation. Mr. Ellis is calling to order again. Gentlemen, quiet. Mr. Quiet, please, quiet. General Houston, I will now give you your orders. As Commander-in-Chief of the Texas Army, you're ordered forthwith to repair to such place on the frontier as you may deem advisable. You will proceed to establish headquarters and organize an army, and you will require all officers of the army of whatever grade to report to you. And, uh, as it is uh, impossible at this time to determine any particular line of action, you will act according to the emergencies of the occasion and the best dictates of your own judgment for the purpose of protecting our frontier and advancing the best interests of our country. Thank you, sir. Good day. Well, I've just heard General Houston's orders are given to him by Mr. Ellis. The General has saluted Mr. Ellis now. He's coming this way, pushing his way through the delegate. They're shaking his hands, patting him on the back, and wishing him well. Oh, General, General Houston, this is CBS. Yes? General Houston, can you tell us anything about your plans? It is my intention to fight Santa Ana. But are you ready, sir? Is Texas ready to challenge to fight the immense army of Santa Ana? When is Texas not ready to fight? What about the Alamo, General Houston? Can you tell us anything about the Alamo? Colonel Travis and his boys are standing at the Alamo for one purpose, to give me time to organize a defense against Santa Ana. They saw their duty. They did not waver. I will not waver in mine. Can you give us a message to the American people, General Houston? Yes. You heard the dispatch from Colonel Travis. He said... Give me help, oh my country. Well, I say, 
Volunteers from the United States for the Army of Texas will be welcome. I say to all red-blooded Americans, come to Texas. Come with a good rifle. And come soon. In the name of the men of the Alamo, liberty or death. Thank you, General Sam Houston, Commander-in-Chief of the Army of Texas. The General is leaving the building now, surrounded by the delegates. These people have placed their highest hopes in Sam Houston, the tight-lipped, broad-shouldered ex-governor from Tennessee, upon whose military skill their very lives are now dependent. Undoubtedly, the events that have happened here in the last few minutes have given John Daly, our CBS correspondent near the Alamo, the first official news of the situation inside the mission. So now, John Daly. I heard some faint sounds from the shortwave transmitter inside the Alamo. The couriers behind Santa Ana's lines have disappeared. The silence has deepened. The wind continues to howl, and the first rays of the sun are now beginning to streak the battlefield before me. I can't tell you how deeply all of us here were moved by the reading of the message from Colonel Travis. As we heard his words, we were able to look down on the mission to see the pitiful inadequacy of its defenses. Less than 200 men against 3,000. The odds are staggering, and they become epic when you stop to think that they were chosen by the less than 200. I keep watching that road over which reinforcements must come. There's no sign of help, but there is something coming through by shortwave from the Alamo. We have a shortwave receiver tuned to their frequency, and the signal is clear. Let's listen to it. Lieutenant Colonel Travis, our garrison commander, has a message. Here is Lieutenant Colonel Travis. To the people of Texas and all Americans in the world, fellow citizens and compatriots, I have sustained a bombardment and a continual cannonade for many days, and I've not lost a man. I shall never surrender or retreat. I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Victory or death. This is the Alamo. This is the Alamo. That was the commander of our garrison, Lieutenant Colonel William B. Travis, appealing for reinforcements. I hope we're getting through. I hope you heard the colonel, because we sure need those reinforcements. Now, here's the Honorable Davy Crockett. He wants to say a word. Howdy. Can't talk long, because it looks like we got a little excitement to hear about. Some of you folks are wondering what an ex-congressman is doing down here in San Antonio. Well, I had a bit of a difference of opinion with my constituents back home in Tennessee. I told them that if they didn't re-elect me, they might all go to places, and I'd go to Texas. Here I am. And here's where every freedom-loving man ought to be. I'm proud to identify myself with the fighting men of Texas. I consider it a rare honor to be able to defend in company with my fellow citizens, the liberties of our common country. That was the Honorable Davy Crockett talking to the people of the United States of America. Where are you, lad? You coming? We're waiting on you. This is the Alamo. This is the Alamo. Hope we're getting through. Uh, I reckon you folks might, might like to know how we're making out here. Well, we, we got beans enough, corn enough, and I ain't heard no complaining yet about the supply of liquid refreshments. It's, uh, it's quiet now. Too darn quiet for comfort, if you're asking me. Some of the boys are catching a little shut-eye at the posts. And we made up that when the attack comes, uh, the bell here will be rung. And that'll be the alarm. Well, now, some of the boys got some messages there they want me to send, so here goes. Pinky Benedict says... But his wife not to worry, and maybe it'd be a good idea if she visited her sister in Memphis for a stretch. Wally Bradley, he says for his good brother to be sure he watches out for his traps, he said, in the bayou. And to move him over to Short Creek for Beaver in, in about a month. Uh, now, this, this next one is kind of personal, so all you people listening, stop up here, see? It's from Dick Simon. He says to his wife that he 
sure loves her a heap. And kiss the baby for her. <laughs> kiss him for me, too, Mom. Well, now that... That's all for now. This is the Alamo signing off. We'll try to get back on the air again soon. Signing off. Signing off. You have just heard the first radio message direct from the Alamo. The convention on the Brazos must have heard it also, so back to Convention Hall and Ken Roberts. The impact of the message from the Alamo on the delegates assembled here was profound. They gathered around the radio and hung on every word. Their faces reflected their anxiety, their anguish, their prayers for the boys at the Alamo. But they have not permitted their feelings to sway them from their determination to make Texas free. The delegates have taken up their new day's labor on the draft of the Constitution. They are determined that the time granted them by the stand at the Alamo must not be wasted. These few days of respite may mean the difference between victory for free Texas or death for its dream of independence. And help is on the way, we know that, as Travis and his men hold off Santa Ana on the western frontier. Volunteers from the United States are pouring in from the east. They're coming, they're on the march. Men from Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, and Indiana. Men from Maine and New York and Massachusetts. Right at this moment, a transport loaded with troops headed for Texas is about to pull out from a wharf somewhere in Louisiana. For an on-the-spot description of the embarkment of these volunteers, we take you now to Jackson Beck. This is Jackson Beck on the wharf in Louisiana. A crack regiment of militia, Colonel Thomas Watson commanding, is aboard ship and ready to sail for Texas. There's a band here on the deck serenading the boys, and hundreds of people have turned out to see them all. I'm not permitted to give you their exact number, but I can tell you that the number is not meager, and the men are packed with fight. For the past few days, ever since news of Santa Ana's advance and the siege of the Alamo reached New Orleans, an air of wild excitement has spread over the city. Though the United States government maintains a strict policy of official neutrality, it is inevitable that the natural sympathy for the American colonists in Texas should be translated into action. Enlistment officers are on every street corner. The role of volunteers swells every hour. Uh, beside me now is the man who commands this detachment, Colonel Tom Watson. Colonel Watson, uh, it looks like your men are anxious to get to Texas. Anxious? If that steamboat don't sail fast enough, I reckon as well they'll get out and swim. We're all anxious. We're proud to be able to lend a helping hand to our brothers of Texas. To fight for freedom, sir, is man's greatest privilege. If the boys at the Alamo are listening, here's our message to them. We are coming. We are marching to Texas. Victory or death. Thank you, Colonel Watson. There goes the ship bell. She's ready to go out. Colonel Watson's going aboard. The excitement of the crowd is now at peak level. The lines have been thrown off. There's the ship's whistle. The big side wheel is beginning to turn. You can probably hear it. Fleshing the water as the ship gets underway. Now the crowd's going stark raving crazy. This is the CBS studio in Washington on the Brazos. We have interrupted Jackson Beck because we have a report of action at the Alamo. We take you now to John Daly. Santa Anne has begun the attack on the Alamo. The Alamo bells are sounding the alarm. The Mexican bugles are calling for the charge. We can see it all. It's like a play on a stage spread out before our eyes. The Mexican infantry dragging escalades to scale the walls is pouring over the little patch of ground that has separated the Alamo from the Mexican forces. They've been met with a withering fire from the Texans' rifles and small cannons. And although Santa Ana's men are falling like flies, they're still pressing forward. The ground is covered with bodies. The Mexican losses will be terrific no matter what the outcome. But no one can doubt their bravery. Some of the escalades are against the walls of the Alamo now. But as far as I can see, not a single Mexican has yet been able to scale them. The smoke and the dust of battle has settled like a pall on this bloody scene. We can hear gunfire, the shouts of officers, the moans and the screams of the wounded. It's a ghastly, horrible glamour of blood and war. There seems to be some slackening of fire from within the Alamo. And Mexican troops have rallied and are storming the walls once again. They're up on the escalades. I think they've mounted the ladders and are getting inside the Alamo. But there's so much smoke and dust, it's impossible to be sure. Here come the Mexican cavalry. About a thousand horsemen, they're charging across the field. Their sabers are glittering in the sun. Their horses setting up a terrific cloud of dust. The Alamo is calling. Our shortwave receiver is blasting a message. The Alamo is on the air. I'm here to do a shot. I can see them pouring over the wall and drop them into the courtyard. It's a walking package you take it from me. Oh, the underways, or some kind of a scaffold or something. Colonel Travis has set up a little cannon. 
He's got it aimed right smack in the courtyard. which flew from Santa Ana's lines, and we wonder how many Texas survivors there are, if any. Santa Ana has promised there will be none, and Santa Ana is noted for his cruelty. He has gained the Alamo, but strictly from a military point of view, he has lost something far more precious, surprise and time. If the defenders of the Alamo had not held him here for two weeks, if they'd permitted him to march eastward into the heart of Texas, it's impossible to say what the consequences would have been for Texas' dreams of independence. But now, because of what these less than 200 heroes have done against the enemy's 3,000, now Texas has a fighting chance for freedom. Undoubtedly, they've won for themselves immortality. Undoubtedly, they'll never be forgotten. There will be others who will take their places. Of that you may be certain, for Texas has only just begun to fight. And at this very moment, General Sam Houston is gathering an army of volunteers, men who will soon be ready to take the field against Santa Ana, men who are even now dedicating themselves to avenging the slaughter here. Mexicans are still scaling the Alamo walls amidst the confusion of the litter traffic. San Antonio, March 6, 1836. The Alamo falls, but Texas independence is saved. You have been listening to CBS Is There, the sixth in a special summer series of broadcasts of famous events. Next week, the Roman Empire, August 26, 79 A.D. Mount Vesuvius erupts and destroys Pompeii. CBS is there. CBS is there is produced and directed for Columbia by Robert Lewis Shayon. Tonight's broadcast was written by Irv Tunick. Democracy isn't just a system of government. It's a doctrine of mankind. It teaches that the next fellow is as good as you, whether he's white or colored, Jew or Gentile. Some people with Nazi techniques are trying to sow the seeds of hatred and prejudice in America. America is no place for it. If someone runs down a neighbor's race or religion... Remind him that he's out of joint with democracy. Help keep America democratic and strong. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.